Do you wonder if others are dealing with the same project management challenges as you? Not sure where to turn for guidance and leadership? Office Hours are in session as we discuss project management and PMOs with global leaders, hearing their story and learning their secrets to success. Our goal is to empower you and help you elevate your PMO and project management career to new heights. Welcome back to Project Management Office Hours with your host, PMO Joe. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours. We're the number one live project management radio show in the United States, broadcasting to you today from our studios in Tempe, Arizona. I'm PMO Joe. I want to share with everybody that we have a special guest joining us today, of course. He's in a kind of a home away from home. He's off at a training session. We'll get that introduction from him shortly, but just want to let you know that uh, He's not calling in from his home country, so we get the benefit of two locations today from our guest. Also want to share with everybody, this is kind of fun for me. This is my 99th show, so next show for me will be number 100, uh, which is hard to believe. Our first show was back on February 20th in 2018. Our special guest was Jill Smith, uh, so thank you to Jill for jumping with me and and being a guinea pig when I didn't really even know what I was doing on that show. I didn't really have an idea of what we wanted to do because I certainly never started out intending to do a project management radio show or podcast. Uh, but here we are, 100 episodes later, 40 million plus plays and downloads of the podcast. So uh, it's been a fun adventure for sure. And certainly thank you to everybody out there for uh, being with me. And I mention all of that because. In order for me to get where I am today, I recognized I needed to get out of my comfort zone, right? I was comfortable as a project manager, but I was not a radio host. I'm not a podcaster. This isn't what I do. But in order to get where I needed to be, I had to stretch myself and stretch my capabilities and enter the unknown. Um, And certainly I did that full of trepidation and a lot of arm twisting from some others to get me there. But I also did that with excitement to be able to see where it got me. So I encourage everybody in the project management space to be able to find your opportunity to stretch beyond your comfort zone, right? So often in the project space, we as project managers end up staying within our industry or within the type of projects we run uh, or maybe a specific tool that we do. And ultimately, I think we grow as professionals when we go outside that zone. So explore the unknown for you and, and take that risk because I think we truly find growth and we learn what our potential can be when we step out that outside that comfort zone. So strongly encourage everybody to do that. And I'm a, a kind of a testament to everybody out there that it's possible and good things can happen when you, when you do that. Also, of course, want to thank the PMO squad and the PMO leader. They are sponsors for the show and, and they make that happen. Strongly encourage everybody to go out and visit the PMO squad website or the PMO leader website. A lot of great information out there. And the PMO squad, of course, is the premier PMO and project management consulting firm in the United States. And we'd love to come help your organization deliver projects better. Uh, Lastly, before we uh, get into the show here with our guest, you know, listen, this show is free for everybody. And it's one PDU. This is our 99th show. So that's 99 free PDUs for people. If you go out to listen to our podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms or go out to uh, the PMO Squad website and see the podcast out there, if you need PDUs, which you all do if you're certified, not only do you get what I think is, is a good show to listen to, but it's almost like a mentoring session with every one of these amazing leaders that we bring on from around the world. So uh, so strongly encourage everybody to go do that. Get your PDUs, no cost, and it's a good time. I do see we've got uh, people joining us. So certainly uh, in the comments, add in where you're calling from or listening from. And if you have questions or comments during the show, don't be bashful. Uh, It's always an interactive show. So let us know what you're thinking. We're uh, live, right? We're uh, live radio on the Business Radio X platform. We're also broadcasting live on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Facebook. So there are a lot of ways to be able to connect and view the show today. And with that, I want to introduce to us our special guest. 
Ben Peters. Hello, Ben. How's it, Joe? And uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great uh, to be part of your show and also great to know that I can uh, also utilize and gain some of my PDUs for myself. So <laughs> I will definitely do the required. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so share with us, you're, you're originally from South Africa, right? But you're not there now. Where are you at today? So um, I'm currently in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I'm attending the project, uh, the IPMA International Project Management Association's Project Excellence uh, Model Training, which will happen from tomorrow up until the end of, of Sunday. And then I'm returning back home to Cape Town on Sunday. Oh, on, on Monday. And um, the purpose for me being here is just to attend the training is that I believe I would like uh, to see if I can uh, utilize the project excellence model enrolled in South Africa, uh, in Cape Town, in the, at the Metropole and see if we can, what is needed for us to better deliver on our projects based on a well-established model that we can utilize and further enhance our own projects in, 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 in South Africa itself. I love that. So here we are, we're uh, speaking project management live internationally while you're at a project management training conference, which is fantastic, right? It just yeah. goes to show the global reach of our industry and our profession. Um, and also it goes to show the need for continuous improvement, right? And not resting on our laurels. You're out there trying to see what you can learn and, and how to take that back and help your team. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that uh, because uh, I've got one of my colleagues with me um, in uh, in Amsterdam as well, and uh, Mark Haywood uh, is one of his, he's my manager for project and program management, um, attending this with me. And we had a quick discussion earlier this morning where we just discussed uh, what is it that we want to get out of this. We normally reflect quite hard on ourselves on achievements the good, the bad, the ugly, but also the beautiful. Um, normally people are just good doing the bad and the ugly, but we also try to normally reflect and sit down and uh, see, 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 see the positive side of things as well. While we're trying to reflect, um, the, when we had the discussion this morning, I said to him, so Mark, we sit down in three years from now, where do you see program management be in the city of Cape Town? We started approximately three years ago with stage gate management and roll it out into the met metropolitan and make sure that we follow stage gate uh, guidelines um, and expose all our projects within the government spectrum in Cape Town through a formalized project uh, preparation process. And um, when we started with that, it was, it, it, it was, it was very it was low uh, immaturity. We, we tried it, we learned from things, we enhanced it. And um, when we had the discussion this morning, and we just reflected from where we've been three years later to where we are now. It's nice to see the number of projects coming through. It's nice to see what the, what the quality of preparation of projects is and how that is prepared. It's nice to see, to um, understand what is the stuff that we need to continuously enhance. There's, there's definitely always opportunities for us to improve. We believe in continuous improvement. Also to try to just uh, understand that. And when we said that, that is exactly what we want to reflect on over a three-year period with program management. When I said to him, where are you going to be within in a year's time? He said to me, a year is so short and you would like to have these, these mini milestones, but we also got to acknowledge the fact that it's taking time. And in three years' time, we would like to have a well-established uh, a, a well established pro, a, a product. We would like to have an um, understanding of exactly what, program management means within the city of Cape Town and within our context, it is misunderstood. The guys don't really understand what they're doing from a program management point of view. And um, it's for us to try to turn that around and make sure that we, that, 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 that we share the message and that we, everybody can learn from us. I mean, as you, as you know, uh, when I talked about a little bit of continuous improvement, um, I'm, I'm an industrial engineer myself. Um, I studied industrial engineering in Pretoria, South Africa, and um, after which I've done some of my honours degree and uh, later my PMP, so they continued that with uh, my my MBA uh, at the University of Edinburgh, or not University of Edinburgh, in Edinburgh at the University of Heriot-Watt, 
and um, at the Edinburgh Business School. And um, when 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 I studied industrial engineering, I initially thought that I'm going to end up in the transport logistics space and the logistics towards optimization improvement. I found myself in the in the project management space, and I still apply those particular industrial engineering principles that I've learned during my studies because that is what studies is doing it's just changing your mindset changing how you think in, in life but still utilizing those particular skills um, that i learned from in the industrial engineering point of view optimization improvement continuous looking to to do things better still utilizing that even in my space in the project management field my introduction to you was through the pmo global alliance where your PMO, right with the city of Cape Town, was named the top PMO of the year in Africa, the entire continent of Africa, and then was into the final four for best PMOs of the world. So that mindset of continuous improvement seems to be working, right? I mean, what an honor to be named best in a continent and one of the four best in the world. So congratulations to you and your team for all of that as well. No, th thanks for that. Um, uh, it, it's quite amazing. Uh, I have, I've got, yes, and I had uh, multiple engagements um, with senior, senior resources within the city of Cape Town. So um, just some background for you. So the Global Awards was, was given, uh, I think it was the 11th of November last year uh, when we got the, got the results. We had um, municipal local elections on the 1st of November last year. We got a new mayor, a brilliant, brilliant directive and a young energetic mayor within the city of Cape Town, newly appointed. And he was in, introduced to the city, uh, I think it was on the 15th of November, four days after our award. And I had to then um, engage with all the new political structures and um, the political leadership, we call them the mayoral committee, um, and need to have multiple engagements with them. And uh, I've added a little slide uh, when I introduced my unit and what we're doing, the global awards um, and, and that little banner. And I just said to the guys, uh, I will still continue with the bragging rights at least uh, <laughs> for the next six months, uh, because we are very proud at, at the achievement. What, what makes the achievement much more honorable for us is the fact that uh, we've been the first government institution in South Africa that won the South African Awards. We competed against multiple private sector and other government institutions, and we're the first government institution that got it right to win South Africa and then to went on further to win the African Awards. And that is what was, what, what was making it very special for us is um, uh, that you can deliver in government sector, you can do certain things and apply the same principles that you've got from a private sector into the government sector as well. Sometimes I say to my, to, 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 to my executive director, it's about the mindset, it's about who, what you're trying to achieve, how you're going to try to achieve those kind of things. I was at, in, in the private sector for a very long time, approximately 12, 13 years before I joined up with the city of Cape Town and when I actually became part of the team. Then as I became part of the team, I utilized that particular um, skill of time equals money, that principle uh, in, 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 in my world. And um, I can recall when I started with the city, I was very frustrated initially because I was sitting in my office and um, uh, the first month and a half, two months were very, very frustrated, uh, limited. It's training, it is exposure, trying to understand how the city is doing things. It felt at one particular point that uh, tomorrow is, another, is just another day. Uh, there's no real drive to continuously improve, continuously move harder, and just to go to bed and you know you've done, you've deserved uh, what you've done to, to, to be rewarded for, 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 for your effort, because that's why we work. A couple of a couple of months were passed. I think uh, in my fourth month, um, I was asked. To, there was a, a major drought uh, in, in in Cape Town in 2016, 2017. During the drought, it was the worst in uh, 300 years. We had our dam levels within the metro went up to approximately 11 percent of available water 
And mm. we know at that particular point in time that uh, we're on the verge of a major disaster because our dam levels were so severely drained that we haven't had water and that that little bit of water that you had left pretty much it's difficult to pump out etc cetera, etc cetera. so i was then approached uh, to come up with and to be part of the strategic team and uh, i was appointed the program manager for for the water disaster and that's where my life changed within the city of cape town um, when i got my uh, my a real opportunity to indicate to the to 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 our executives and to the team what I'm capable and how I'm doing things. And uh, um, I mean, we had a brilliant strategy. We came up with a strategy in approximately a week. We had limited sleep. It was me and uh, my executive director at that point in time, Craig Craig Kesson, Gareth Morgan, and Catherine Schneider were part of the team from a strategic and resilience point of view. We then uh, drafted and we planned this disaster and what needs to be done at what particular points and how to improve that. And um, we got to a supply versus demand approach where you want to make sure that you've got a balance between the supply and demand. Uh, you're trying to mitigate your risk from a supply point of view. What's the additional capacity that can and should be created long, medium and long term? demand point of view, what is it that you need to, to be able to achieve? We were the first major city across the world that got it right to reduce water demand from 1,200 megaliters per day to 467 at a particular point in time, which is almost two thirds less water use per day. Where we had the change campaign and uh, just continuously drive the um, the minimization of, of water use uh, turned down the pressure in in in, in the entire organization or in the entire city, and just keep on driving that. And ultimately, after after the water uh, disaster, we started handing over. Uh, there was a new water strategy developed for within the city of Cape Town uh, with our water water clients, and uh, that water strategy is now being implemented, and it's in full swing. The rain came back, so we we were very happy. We 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 laugh, and as we as we delivered on that particular one, approximately two or three months after that, there was a a huge fire in a, a informal settlement in Cape Town. We call it Imizamu Yetu or IY. That particular fire demolished the entire U informal settlement, and uh, with our unique approach that we had. We ultimately, from the PMO itself, we got we got a rapid planning, rapid understanding of the problem, and a rapid solution towards also helping the um, that particular individuals in the informal settlement and to 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 make sure that we 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 assist them, rebuild their houses, rebuild the, the infrastructure, and now currently in progress is what we call super blocking, where we just try to make sure that these uh, formal services and um, former roads, former water and electricity that can be accessed at any particular point in time so that it's not so condensed in that informal settlement areas where you, go, where you can't have access to a place when a fire starts, but ultimately where you want to make sure that you deliver on those particular things. And as per that approach, you know what happened with COVID. Uh, the, first, the first person that was, that was dealt with COVID was myself. Please, can you be at the office tomorrow morning at seven o'clock, we've got a major disaster. We've got to roll it out. And we, we had a very unique approach to, to COVID. Uh, we realized immediately uh, after our president uh, uh, talked about uh, COVID and the lockdown and what it's going to mean. We knew exactly at that particular point in time of uh, the severity and the scale and the size of, 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 of what it means. I can recall that I had, um, for approximately five weeks in, in a row, me and my team had between three and four hours of sleep a day for the first five weeks of our COVID, COVID response. We continuously just, we just ramped up and we piggybacked on each other. Uh, when one guy's going to bed, the rest of the team is still continuing with the work so that there's limited. When you start, when you've done your, your, your sleeping, you can just get a quick recap of the work that was happening within that uh, three hour period or four hour period. A catch up and then the next guy will go to bed and there's continuity in just ramping up and working continuously and uh, the achievements that we've got was that we've we've within a seven week period we've planned and executed 39 additional field hospitals across the metropolitan 
where we uh, were able to split the hot and the cold patients. Uh, what that's what we call it, the non-positive and the positive payments from a from a COVID point of view for testing and those particular purposes. Um, um, redesign of the use of our public transport facilities um, with sanitizers and the social distancing rules and everything that we've with, that we've implemented within our informal settlements. Uh, trying to make sure that because that is the, the, the most difficult part to manage your social distancing uh, and everything is so dense and condensed on each other. So try to make sure that we apply some of the social distancing rules in the informal settlements. And then my team were ultimately responsible for the first mass vaccination site uh, last year, May, within the city of Cape Town, where we did approximately, yes, you're very close to, Two million or three million vaccinations in a very, very, very short limited time period. We've established two sites, uh, two mass vaccination sites. The one was at the city of Cape Town International Conference Center, where we implemented that particular site with the assist. Uh, 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 because within our spaces of government, there's different roles and responsibilities, and the roles and responsibilities for the COVID response is actually with provincial government, but because they didn't have the, uh, the, the project management capacity in-house, they reached out to me and they asked me to provide our services free of charge to them so that we can uh, uh, benefit both sides, both as a, a government institutions. And therefore being, uh, well, trying to help them, we, we've implemented those sites. We've also done the, 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 the drive-in site within Cape Town. Uh, that site is actually coming to an end now by the end of this month. Uh, been operating for more than seven months now. Uh, we had a little donkey car the one day that uh, uh, I think the, the site was open for a week and there was a donkey car that <laughs> came through this uh, particular uh, site and a lot of pictures and the donkey car driver was sitting on his donkey car having his, his, his vaccination with his family and then drove further, which was yeah. so special. And Whatever uh, it takes, right? Yeah. Yes, and what <laughs> it was just uh, such a pleasure. And uh, the tears were running just to understand the difference that you make in other people's life. And uh, it, you, you sometimes think it's just for granted, but it's not. It's actually it's um, this great contribution that we do in in the project management field. That we're touching lives, and uh, you you you're affecting other people. On a daily basis, and I think that's the reason why why I keep on working in 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 the, in, in this space. Yeah, I mean that's a amazing work you you've done, and and certainly as a government agency to be able to do that, we often think, of course, PMOs within businesses, and we always say you need to drive value, you need to have value that mm -hmm. comes out of your PMO. Well, man, when you start talking about helping a population overcome a drought or a fire or a natural disaster or a pandemic it's a different kind of value, but certainly just as impactful and a testament to the work you've done with your team, of course. And, and you mentioned something while you were chatting, it brings back prior to the show, we, we've connected and we've chatted in the past as well. And you said that you were hard driving and you were driving through these initiatives and you had shared a story with me kind of early in your career about getting called out when you were a project manager and how that's kind of shaped your your personality now. Mm -hmm. Can you share that with uh, with everybody? Yeah, yeah. So I was, um, so I was, I was young. I think it, I was about one year, two years out of university. Just started wor working with a little uh, consulting company in in Pretoria. We did multiple projects in uh, the mining environment, um, and there, this young attitude, uh, project management, uh, pro project managers going. And he's gonna do this particular project uh, in in the mining environment. And uh, as you know how, how it is, uh, you think you know everything once you study it, and uh, no one can tell you any can tell you anything. And uh, you pretty much just uh, the world's gift, and uh, everybody's gonna accept what you do. And uh, yeah, I went to the to the general manager of the mine the one day, and uh, he stopped me in the corridor. And uh, in the corridor, he said to me. He stopped me and he said, uh, how's, the, how's the project doing, Ben? And I said to him, you know what? Uh, and we were talking of Afrikaans, but I said to him, um, Johan, I'm, I'm waiting on this. I'm waiting on this. I'm waiting on this. This is where we are now, but I wait for this. And I also wait for this. And the next moment, 
he was taking his cell phone out and I didn't know what he was going to do, but he, he took his cell phone out. He started, he, he, he called my boss and I didn't know he's calling my boss, but now he's calling my boss and my boss answers the phone. And then I realized he's phoning my boss and he said to my boss, I've got the waiter with me. He's like, and the waiter? Yeah. He said, no, it's Ben. The waiter is here with me. He is waiting for this and he's waiting for that. And he's waiting for that. And I cannot, I cannot wait. Can you please address this matter for me? And at that, that was the turning point in my career, not to, to do two things. The one is um, to always be proactive. I am known within the city of Cape Town as an implementer, as a driver, as a continuous enforcer. I'm thriving for change. I like change. Not all people do, but I'm not waiting for anything. So if a, if a person asks me where we are, I can exactly tell you, this is where we are. This is where I want to be, where I want to be. This is why I'm there, or yes or no, and where I'm going to be tomorrow or the day thereafter. Because I hated that moment where I was caught out being a, called a waiter. Um, mm. For me, that was a turning point because you don't want to be a waiter. You want to be, you want to be a, a person that people can rely on. And if they ask you what is the status of a project, um, you can give them the honest, real feedback without with them giving the comfort that we're on the right track you are all going to experience delays you are all going to experience things that you never planned for but what are you doing to overcome those challenges and obstacles on a continuous basis and that is the that is the attitude that i that i keep on keep on implementing on a, on, a, on a daily basis within within my space the guys normally uh, in my office uh, they normally joke with me and then they they will say that um, Ben never can say no. He, he, he can't say no. Um, when people are asking me for something, I will be the first one to say, we send people to the moon. We can do everything. It's a, dependent on our nature and our thinking of what the possible best solution might be. Therefore, I never say no. If there's a request for me to be involved or to roll out or to do a project or to tell where the portfolio is stand, what is wrong with the portfolio, then I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just keep on driving and I will always just deliver. I never say no to any of my resources. I say, yes, we can. We can do if we all work together as a team to deliver that. Remember that it's not just about me. And uh, I think I shared that with you as well. I have, I've got a very competent team. One of the reasons why I brought Mark with me to Netherlands, I've got a lady with the name Maureen Ware, uh, who's driving contract management for me in the, in, in the organization, which is a very technical space um, with our procurement laws and everything in, in our space. It's not just as you're signing a contract and there you go. There's a lot of additional requirements from from contract management point of view. Um, I've got Ian Thompson, who's driving the one of the directorate PMOs for me. I've got uh, Aziz Shabudun, is driving the portfolio for me. So it's a... Uh, and then uh, a guy with the name Gerrit Pafir who's driving the engineering management services for me within the city of Cape Town. So I always say it's not just, it's not Ben. Um, it's not, please, it is the PMO that's delivering and it's the team that's delivering. I always compare myself um, with, uh, with, 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 with sport uh, in, your, in your particular environment. Uh, we can refer to NFL if, if, if it's applicable, but you can only have one quarterback, you can only have a certain number of defensive and offensive players. And you all, you, you gotta, you gotta only, only have a number of people on the bench, but there's a support team and there's other people in the background that's never been seen, which is playing a vital part into the success of what's happening with the particular team. And I always say, if that team is coming together, then you will be able to succeed. And that's the, 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 the main principles, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a junkie. I love sport, any kind of sport. My wife normally jokes with me and she, would, and she tells me that if um, standing outside, walking in the garden was a sport, I would, would, would also have, have watched that on TV because I'm just passionate about sport. And uh, there's so much value that we can learn from sport into our own life. But more importantly, how can we how can how can sport and other things learn from our side yeah. and uh, what's the, what's the input that you can give from a sport point of view into that world yeah i i love 
the story, and, and certainly we're getting good feedback and comments. Stacy uh, mentioned in the book, Dr. Seuss uh, has a book there that addresses don't be a waiter out there. And certainly uh, Louise Worsley says thank you for helping her get vaccinated uh, there in South right. Africa. Nice to hear that, Louise. And certainly people joining us from around the U.S. as well, Texas, Arizona, and New York and beyond. Uh, you mentioned the sports, and I'm a sports nut as well. Uh, I, I, same thing. I, no matter what's happening, I could be doing sports or, or watching sports or involved in sports. And right now, I'm uh, training for a half marathon that's coming up in June. I know you're an endurance athlete as well. You're a triathlete. Part of my planning for my, my marathon has been to approach it like a project, right? It's a unique endeavor that has a unique beginning and end. And I can plan it and I'm going to execute it and I'm going to manage it and all that. Have you utilized that same sort of mindset within your triathlete mm -hmm. training as well? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, it's all about preparation, uh, Joe. In the real project life, there's a lot of uh, articles and research about the benefits of project preparation, project planning towards the execution of projects uh, of which I firmly believe and I've witnessed it myself. We've got a big drive in the city of Cape Town um, on project preparation and project planning, making sure that we understand what we're going to do so that you don't get surprises during the execution that could have been planned up front. But I do exactly focus the same the same aspects of my life in my in my personal life as well. I do believe in in proper good planning up front, uh, preparing for for races. I've uh, I can tell you an interesting story. In 2019, I was doing a race, a mountain bike race, in September. So for that mountain bike race in September, I started started training approximately eight weeks ahead of time, maybe a bit more and uh, got myself well prepared for that particular race and it's a hundred kilometer mountain bike mountain bike race from um i think it's from uh, uniondale to nice now they call it the career to coast where you run right from the career to the the coastal city there i was and i was doing very good i was doing very well um i had a i had a sub five hour time uh which, uh, which, 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 which I tried to make, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And after the race, I just stopped, stopped training a bit, give the the the, the body opportunity to just uh, recover, and then move on. So then that was end of September. There was October, November, uh, the last week of October. The uh, the the CFO of the city asked me whether I would like to have a mountain bike race with him in two weeks time and am I still wait am I still working out and training hard and, and will, will I will I share and will I try and just do the race with him so at that particular point in time I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't training I was off and uh, recovering but I was so excited to be invited <laughs> to <laughs> just go out and do do this particular race with him I said to him yes I'm happy so yeah there's two weeks I've got two weeks to get fit again it is hard. It, uh, and you know that in two weeks' time, you're not going to be able to get the same amount of fitness than what you've got in eight weeks. And I mm -hmm. should have just kept on training continuously. But I didn't. I didn't plan. I did not prepare. It is out of the block box. And I will just say, yes, I'm going to do this. Two days before the race, I got myself, I bought myself a new mountain bike. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> so there I've got two weeks of training. I've got a new mountain bike. I'm going with the CFO on this particular particular journey and uh, race day race day came i'm up on the first hill and there we go i'm struggling i'm exhausted see if i was pushing me up the mountain uh, i don't want him to push me i want to finish this thing by myself and i'm exhausted it's just going completely south and got to the first hill 40 minutes or 50 minutes later there's our first downhill and yeah, I'm going downhill. And at the second corner, I did I, I did not take the corner on the left hand side and I attacked the corner. I went outside because they want to pass people. And then I'm off my bike and I broke my shoulder on oh. approximately eight or nine places. But it is to just show you there's a couple of things that I should have done. The one is I should have worked harder and prepared myself, not being that exhausted after the first 10 kilometers of the hill that I could have done better if I planned correctly. 
And I, you don't go and buy a new bike two days before a race and don't ride that bike uh, on a downhill if you don't know what it can and what it cannot be, <laughs> cannot do. Therefore, go and just be safe. And it uh, resulted in me uh, being very patient uh, of, of, of any training for approximately three months. I was in a sling. I can recall I went to, to Edinburgh to get my MBA degree and I was in a sling because <laughs> I had to broke a shoulder, I had to uh, fly with a broken shoulder. And it was for about three, three months I was off the bike, no training, nothing, very frustrated. Uh, just want to come back and get this over and done with. Went, uh, But the nice story is that I, I, I followed the, uh, and, and the doctor said to me, he did what he can do. Um, and uh, put in the screws and everything to the shoulder. And he said he did everything he could have done. The rest is on my hands. I followed the, the, the physiotherapy to the nail. Like if you tell me to do X, I will do it exactly that particular way. And that is the principles that I'm also doing in my project management field, where you can learn from project management field. If the plan is there and it is executable and you know that the plan is working, follow the plan. If you want to divert from the plan, but there's benefits to be gained, then you do that and you be agile and you continue doing that and you continuously improve. But don't just change and don't not prepare. Just rather be prepared because there's going to be consequences afterwards. Yeah, that's a great story. And and just the, because I always like to talk with clients in non-project management terms to make sure that they understand and, and we have the same expectations because they may not understand project management, just like I may not understand engineering terms. So when we talk about a race and you tell the story about how you didn't prepare and then you tried new equipment, they can relate to that, right? They can understand yes. why they need to plan on their project and why they shouldn't introduce new items into the project. Great example to be able to share with everybody. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, if you, if, if you don't mind, what, what what comes to mind just when when you said that was um, uh, I did I did the same race last year. It was just during COVID last year. It was uh, it was open again. Um, I was training very hard last year. Started training in uh, November 2020. Um, I planned to do a race in January that day, in January 2021. The race was unfortunately cancelled, but I continued training. It was moved to to August. Then a week before before August, I got before the race. I actually got COVID, um, mm. and I could not participate in the particular race. So I said, let's uh, look after the health, and I kept on training. And I did the same race where I fell. And um, because of the preparation and me understanding, I, I shaved off an hour and a half of my previous best time over three over three days, uh, which was quite remarkable. And uh, just just being there, being fit, and uh, enjoying what I'm doing now. And you didn't break a shoulder. So, and so I didn't <laughs> break a shoulder. I stayed on the bike. <laughs> and that's also an important lesson, right, in project management. At the beginning of projects, right, it's important to be able to make sure you have the right requirements. And so often people, the sponsors or the stakeholders are like, let's just go, just, just go and we will get this done. And it's upon us to stress to them how important it is to make sure that we capture the requirements so that we can satisfy those uh, expectations. Because sometimes going slower at the beginning to make sure it's properly prepared and planned actually helps you help go faster. And a good case in point with your training, you prepared for it and you went an hour and a half faster, right? I mean, there's proof to that when it's put into practice. And what about the lessons learned? Uh, I think people generally forget about those lessons. What's the lessons that I've learned? And uh, as mentioned earlier, when I reflect, um, I don't just reflect on the on 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 the on, on the bad stuff. I normally call it the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a difference between good, bad, ugly, and beautiful. Because the beautiful stuff is those that's extremely helpful, which you will always uh, really go back to. The ugly is the exact opposite. And then the good and the bad is what worked, what did not. And we tend to forget about uh, focusing on what was the good things that, that we've done that helped us performing. And uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to, to make sure that uh, I continuously, continuously thrive on going forward. So obviously you've shared some amazing successes. You, you're one of the top four PMOs in the world, at least for until next November, right? This coming November, <laughs> right? You can always carry those bragging rights with you. 
you've accomplished so much both personally and professionally. What's next, right? Where do you go from here? I mean, wh- where where is the next uh, challenge and opportunity for you? So um, there's there's still a lot of things that I would like to achieve with within within the city of Cape Town. Um, quite interesting when myself and Mark were working in the streets of Amsterdam this morning. He, he, he asked me the same question. He said to me, Ben, um, when are you moving on? He also said, uh, I said to him, well, my new executive director asked me the same question approximately three or four weeks ago on a one-on-one performance management uh, aspect. And he said to me, what's next? And I said to him, there's, there's three things that I would like to, that I would like to achieve before uh, moving on, before I know that I cannot. Uh, I need to find the new challenge uh, to satisfy my requirements and to move forward. I said to him, the one is, I would like to see that all five disciplines for which I'm responsible for, and which is project management, program management, portfolio management, contract management, and engineering management, that we are a organizational maturity level of standardized practices. We are a huge organization. We've got 40,000 employees. Uh, We've got multiple directorates. Each directorate can be seen as a different business unit with its own standards and stuff. But I would like to, from a corporate point of view within the city of Cape Town, see that we've got a standardized approach for everything in the world of those disciplines. Then the the next thing is what I would like to achieve within the city of Cape Town is that you've got the individuals and these accidental project managers within our space, people that's been thrown at projects which have never done projects. And I would like to make sure that within the city of Cape Town, we at a particular point in time where I can say that uh, we don't have accidental project managers, but project management is seen as a proper skill within the organization. And it's a, it's a skill that one would like to pursue um, where there's benefits to the individuals on a continuous basis. And then I would ultimately like to see um, where the city of Cape Town in terms of rent, uh, I'm going to try to figure it out quickly in my head on, on dollars, but where we can sit from a capital portfolio point of view to see if we can deliver between a $1.5 and $2 billion uh, capital portfolio within the next three to four years. Uh, I think if, if I can achieve those three things, then it's time for me to move on and to, to, to see what is the next best opportunity. I got a, got a request to facilitate and help one of the gov- other gov- government institutions within South Africa called Transnet, uh, where they reached out to me and they said, how can the city of Cape Town help them to also get their PMO in place and learn from, from us on a continuous basis? We're working on, 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 on the on the the back end of what is doable, what is not. But I do think that is what I would like to add. And then in my personal life, it's um, pretty much uh, to, and, and just before I get to the personal life, but, but what I would like to to, to, to see is I, I would like to see that I have made a change, not just in terms of the organization, but I've made a change to my management team, as well as to the individuals working with me. I believe that the next generation of project managers, our young project managers is the future. And I would like to be an example for them. I believe if they can learn from me and I can, I've, I can have a role onto their lives, they, they, there's a great opportunity for them to get better and to take over sometime, someday for me. We don't know whether it's going to be one or two or three years from now, but they, I, I want to create that opportunity. And then I would also like to make sure that from a personal life point of view, uh, I'm trying to stay fit and healthy, as, uh, as as we just discussed. But I would like to see that my kids and my family is is uh, getting through the motions, get their degrees, and get into the into the swing. They're very young still. I've got uh, three kids, ten, nine, and seven, and I would like to take them through the opportunity and give them the best opportunities uh, for all, for them to also get some academic. Uh, qualification and uh, to pursue their dreams. My son is an absolute sport sportaholic. It's sometimes quite a challenge for me to tell him, listen, you've got to work, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to study as well. You've got to make sure that you, you've got some backup plan. Uh, it's not just about the sport. I fully support that. My little uh, first daughter has got a, she's into the drama and she just loves drama and uh, be this drama queen. And then my youngest is just, she's me and uh, in a woman's body. Uh, very close to me and uh, 
just about a very special kid, which I would just like to see also be a very successful person at the end of the day. Yeah, it's great to see your face light up talking about your children. That's great. Uh, <laughs> you know, obviously, it's so important to you, of course. And, you know, you had mentioned in there kind of the standardization of processes that you have in there. And you also you mentioned your your love of sport and you brought up a quarterback. You're going to be one quarterback on the team. <laughs> we always talk about within the PMO squad, we, when we work with our clients about empowering your people and that next gen of project managers. And when you build your standard process, you have to be able to build a team of quarterbacks so that they can call an audible and follow outside the process when necessary, right? The mm. standard process helps you be consistent and be repeatable, but a process can't define every situation. And having a team that you trust and the team that's been trained to the point where they call the audible and they say, instead of yep. doing this the way we've always done it, I can read the room, I can read the team, and we need to do something a little different here. Is, yep. Do you see that within your team as well, the, this, yep. this empowerment of the people to be able to go do what's right, maybe not just follow the process, but do the right thing? Yep, no, 100%. That's exactly what we do. I also try to make sure that everybody else knows exactly what everybody else is doing. Because uh, if you know what the other people's roles and functions is, you know, you can take over when they off the field, when they uh, removed from the field with a red card or with a with a yellow flag or whatever. Then you know what their role and their function is, so you can just dive in and do and yeah, perform that particular function. So it's all about the teamwork again, and uh, the only way to drive that teamwork is to make sure that there's continuity between your individuals. Um, I see. I, I see myself as. A, and I've, I've, I've just did another story. So we've got this project management forum that we've got uh, in the city of Cape Town on every, every February of, of a year. We uh, we uh, invest in uh, or arranging a nice forum. There's uh, approximately, I say, this year we had approximately 300 people joining us on this particular call uh, on this forum. And I had a guy from from the United States with the name Tim Jakes talking to us. Um, he's the uh, IPM, a, spe a special interest group uh, director, talked to us about leadership and uh, uh, applying different leadership styles at, in different situations and opportunities. And when, while he was talking, I was I was sitting with with my colleagues and I said, to, "Where do you guys see me in this particular space?" Um, uh, that I, I see myself. When I'm under pressure, this is who I am. If I'm in a great space, this is the guy that I think I am. Do you guys agree with me on my principles and where you see me from a leadership point of view? And um, I, I try to enable my team. I try to have my make my hands dirty. Um, I don't just direct. I don't just manage. I like to be involved into the details sometimes as well. Uh, up to a point of where I'm so comfortable that I'm not needed anymore and that I'm not uh, uh, adding any, any more value. Uh, but I try to make sure that uh, we always, that I contribute. Uh, I, I hate sitting on the sideline, just shouting on the team and giving instructions. That's not me. My leadership style is make, make sure that I, I'm involved and uh, that I continuously try to enable the team to become better. That's, that's what I, what I strive for. Yeah, that's, Certainly, I would say very apparent uh, just in the, the brief conversations we've had, right, is that how impactful that story you shared earlier about don't be a waiter has influenced your life and how it's actually helped drive you and in, in all of your success that you've had. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. We're getting close to end of time. And certainly I want to be able to share with uh, everybody how to get in touch with you if you can let everybody know whether it's just LinkedIn or email or whatever. And then is there anything else coming up that you have that people should be aware of, whether it's any, any additional competitions that the PMO will be competing in or books or events or speaking, anything uh, for folks to be able to reach out to you? Okay, so you, you, you can reach out to me at uh, borrent.peters at icloud.com. Or you can call me or WhatsApp me at uh, our international code is plus 27. And my number is zero eight two seven eight six double seven four six, and on LinkedIn you will find me under Paul and Daniel Peters. Uh, as mentioned, my mom decided to give me multiple <laughs> names. Uh, she calls me Ben, but uh, I normally joke my wife will call me La Lovey. When she starts calling me Ben, then I know that I didn't listen the first time. When it becomes Paul, then I know that I'm getting into trouble, and when it's a Daniel, then I know. 
I'm in I'm in the red space here. So <laughs> get out of there. So that's just the way that I, me and my wife know each other at this particular point in time. But you can reach me on, on LinkedIn, Boren, Daniel uh, Peters. I'm not big on, on Facebook. Uh, I am a Facebook follower, but uh, I call it in Afrikaans, it's Roofcake. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm using my wife's uh, phone to see what the world is doing. And, and, and But I'm not very active on Facebook, but very much more active on LinkedIn and uh, Next thing's coming up in September. I'll be in Croatia. Uh, I, I'm the head for Smarter Cities uh, Special Interest Group for for the International Project Management Association. We are considering our options uh, at this particular point in time for the uh, PMI, PMP, uh, PMI PMO that's closing the 31st of March. We are considering the options. We, we don't know whether we want to do it this year or maybe the year thereafter. And uh, we are looking at that particular options. And then um, I will be in, uh, hopefully be in Japan for um, for a conference in, in, in November. So yeah, there's, there's some things that have been, been lined up for me. I'm looking forward to share some knowledge. Uh, in, in Japan, the plan is to have a two-fold approach. The one is to talk about competencies and individual competencies, uh, how that relates to the success of a project. And then also trying to have a, what we're doing in the world of smart cities, where we try to make sure that there's livable, sustainable and workable cities that can be implemented via project program portfolio management. And that's what we're trying to achieve from, from a smarter cities point of view. That's fantastic. And as we're talking here and I, I've been listening and I'm trying to picture you and, and the sound of your voice, you've got this amazing baritone voice, right? You should be a, you should read books, right? You should be like one of those when you're li- the audible book, the version of it, you should be reading that. If you, if you have enough things going on, obviously you don't need anything else, but <laughs> a great booming voice to be able to listen to and, and make an impact. I'm normally, I'm normally the one guy in the office when it's your birthday, I will sing the birthday song. The guys <laughs> knows me and I do it with full steam. Uh, I normally say I'm, I'm, I'm singing balls. It's something between bus and false. Uh, so I've got the, this falsetto as well going, but that doesn't matter to me. Uh, my mind is, uh, I, don't, I don't care if I miss a note, uh, as long as people can have a laugh for me singing for them and they can make a difference and they can just enjoy, enjoy the day, then I'm happy. That's fantastic. I love that. Well, Ben, certainly thank you so much for, for being on the show, especially interrupting your uh, training that you're, you're taking there in Amsterdam. I appreciate that. Of course, thank you to everybody who joined us online. Christopher, I'm assuming it's Christopher Worsley had put a comment in there that uh, helps bring back memories listening to you share your story. So, you know, thank you for for sharing that as well. Um, Everybody, please go out and visit the PMOsquad.com and look for our podcast to see all of our previous shows and and our upcoming guests. We've got a great lineup uh, that's going to be joining us. Next show will be number 100, of course, as I mentioned. Following that, we'll have Tim Creasy. Uh, the C Chief Innovation Officer with ProSci will be joining us. Louise Worsley, who was uh, commenting earlier today and on some of this discussion, she'll be joining us from South Africa. Ricardo Martin from Spain. Sanjeev Augustine here in the States. Melissa McDonald, the Smart PM. Kim Essendrup, Asia Watkins, Konstantin Reibel, and Robert Bries from Germany. Uh, and again, maybe, probably not, but maybe Maria Abdelina, Uh, who's in Ukraine, and our thoughts are with her, and hopefully she and all of her loved ones are doing okay. Also, a reminder that all of these shows are recorded. We're live, obviously, as we're interacting with all of you. Uh, But we do record these, right? So if you miss it, certainly go out and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or go out to the PMO Squad site to catch those. 99 PDUs for free currently available. Uh, So don't miss out on that. It's a great opportunity to go get them. And lastly, of course, thanks to the PMO squad and the PMO leader. They're our sponsors and they make all of this possible. That's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Thanks for listening to another episode of Project Management Office Hours with PMO Joe. You're not alone in your project management journey. We're here to help you achieve your goals. Subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on your favorite podcast platform to catch all of our episodes and hear industry leaders share their story and secrets to success.